how's everybody doing? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for having me here and uh, for this time that I get to spend with you. I'm grateful. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about this kind of bigger idea of how Christians should address the pressing problem of poverty. Uh, it's funny because when I talk to uh, Christians, when I go dif to different Christian universities and colleges and I talk to believers, uh, there's never ever any pushback uh, when we talk about the fact that we have a responsibility biblically to care for the poor. I've never heard a Christian argue with that ever. But where you get disagreement um, and even hostility is when we talk about the way that we should help the poor. And the world is really changing. It's a revolutionary place. It's, I would say, a time for lots of optimism, which is the picture I'm going to try to paint today. There's a lot of work to do. But there's never been a more amazing time in terms of optimism about helping the most vulnerable people who live on the planet. But if we want to fuel that, we have to know how we got there. And I will say to you that there is a right way to do this and a wrong way to do it. And if we pursue the wrong means to our end, which is really what economics is about, which is what I'm going to try to bring to the table a little bit, then we might actually end up hurting people that we're trying to help. If we do it the wrong way, we might actually end up hurting the very people we seek to help. And we have to be accountable for that. And so this is important stuff. It's stuff that might keep you up at night. It's stuff that probably um, brings you to prayer. It brings you on mission trips, and we need to understand it. So what I'm going to do and what my institute does is it brings together the disciplines of theology and economics to try to understand the world. So what I'm going to do is really start with who we are in Christ. So the first part of this talk is going to really sound like theology, it is. I'm not a theologian, I work with them and learn from them. And then I'm going to start weaving in some economic realities that affect our everyday lives. You do not have to get a PhD in economics to understand those, so that's exciting, right? That's not the requirement for making the world a better place. However, under, having greater economic literacy is important. And combining these economic realities with our biblical calls then I think we really have some powerful tools to make the world a better, more flourishing place. So that's what I'm going to try to do. In the short time we have together, there's a lot I'm going to try to cover. And um, I've asked um, for help in keeping me disciplined on time. So I want to have time for questions if you have them at the end. So I'm making an assumption here, even on the first slide. Christians must support economic freedom to care for the poor, that we don't have a choice, that economic freedom is uh, a set of institutions that allow people to live into who God created them to be. You live in a society rich with economic freedom, but there are people who wake up every day and do not have that luxury. How do we help change that? So I'm, that's the bottom line up front. And I'm going to kind of spend the next hour trying to tell a story about that. So here we go. How is poverty changing? This is a graph from The Economist magazine, so I'm pulling out all my cliches right at the beginning here. I'm an economist. We have to cite The Economist magazine. This is a cartoon, <laughs> and it describes the change in global poverty since 1990. If you pay attention to anything The Economist says, which you, you might not, <laughs> um, or listen to what the president, Kim Jim, of the World Bank says, it's astounding the accomplishments that the planet has made in just a short period of time. So in 1990, 43 or so percent of the planet lived in abject poverty. 43 percent of the planet. Today, it's under 10 percent for the first time ever in human history. And the president of the World Bank is making these types of claims out loud, not with his friends in his house. He's putting them out there for the press. He says that by 2030, we'll have about 3%, a 3% global level of abject poverty, as defined as living on less than $1.90 a day. 3%. We call that transitional poverty, meaning that there's always going to be tsunamis and hurricanes and bad things that happen. The richer you are, the easier it is to overcome that but people might be transitionally poor. What's important is that they won't be permanently poor. And that's important for God's purposes. 
So I'm going to try to make a, a connection between biblical flourishing and material well-being, that they are actually not at odds, they work together. That might sound radical, probably is. Now, I just described a little bit about the way the world is operating right now. That, those are the empirical facts. We're dealing in facts. Here's what people perceive the world to look like. The Economist just uh, showed a, uh, wrote an article um, based on some surveys that were done. 70% of British citizens in a recent survey thought the world was getting worse. When they were asked, is the world getting better materially or worse, 70% said worse. And only 5% of Americans know that global poverty has been halved in the last 20 years. Only 5% of people know the facts. That's actually really important. Because if we think the world is getting worse, then we're going to set into motion certain sets of actions that are going to try to change that. If we think the world is getting better, then we're going to ask different sets of questions, aren't we? Well, gosh, the world's getting better. How do we make it better faster? There are different questions based on different perceptions of a reality. The world in terms of poverty alleviation is getting better. This is the work of Johan Norberg, who is a Swedish economist who wrote a book called Progress. That's what this is based on. So I, I direct you there for further study. Now, this goes on, and I want to talk about the United States and some of our perceptions of the world. And this is, we're going to go, I'm, I'm bringing out some uh, economic questions, but I'm going to address them from a biblical lens. This is one of my favorite, um, I, well, I shouldn't say favorite, I use it a lot. This is a uh, image that I just got off of Google. I don't know this woman. This is from the Occupy Wall Street movement, which you've probably all heard of. And she has a handmade, handwritten sign, and it says, one day the poor will have nothing left to eat but the rich. I don't know that she literally means that's true, but she metaphorically means it's true. And what, does she, what is she saying? She's saying that when the rich get richer, they do so through exploitation. And that would lead us to believe that income is a zero-sum game that I take from you, make myself better off, and make you equally worse off. I actually suggest to you that there are really no, <laughs> that I kind of understand, zero-sum games. I think if you live in a world of plunder and exploitation like that, it's a negative-sum game. Because now you have to invest a lot of resources in just protecting yourself, right? If you think anybody at any moment is going to come steal your stuff, and that's the way that they get better and richer and have more material things, then you're going to be defensive all the time, right? You're going to get dogs and alarms and all sorts of things. You're going to live in fear. So is income a zero-sum game? Here's the answer to that. It can be. It depends on the institutions. So I would put to you this, that in the United States, we live in a society with lots of economic freedom, which, is, which reflect a set of institutions where people seek profit, and in doing so, they have to find a way to solve problems and make our lives better. Doesn't mean bad things don't happen, and it certainly doesn't mean we eradicate greed. But counter that with a narrative like modern day Afghanistan. Do you know how you become wealthy or have a high income in Afghanistan? You are a thug. It is rule by thugs. It is a, it is a zero, actually negative sum society where to be wealthy, well off, you take, you exploit, your boot is on the back of people who are oppressed their whole lives with no hope of escape. That's not the society that we, we want to live in. So we want to live in a society where even non-Christians have the incentives to serve us, not exploit us. That the way that one makes money is by serving strangers. So that's going to be the tagline of this talk. How do we live in a world where we are encouraged to serve strangers? And why is that biblical? So I want to talk about kind of going right to scripture, and I'm going to go right to Genesis, because I think that's where, as humans, we get our marching orders. And don't you think that as people who are in college trying to figure out what you are going to do with the rest of your life, you would want to go to scripture to get your marching orders first? Now, the scripture isn't going to say, go be a chemical engineer, but it certainly is going to give you principles for how to live your life and your job. So I'm going to go through some of that. 
And I'm going to go hit three points here. What are God's design and desires for his creation? That is incumbent upon us to know. What is God's design and what are his desires in that design for his creation? Second, what principles in creation inform how we live in 2016 and beyond? The Old Testament is not just something that as believers we say, oh, that's informative historically, but I don't need it anymore. No. It's relevant for your life today. What are the guiding principles that we pull from it? And then how does the call to work, which is what I'm going to say are our marching orders, that's what we're given, the job we're given is our work in Genesis, how does that foster greater human productivity and battle poverty? Because that's what this series is about. How, how do Christians think about reductions in poverty? What's our role? So what are God's purposes in creation? I won't read all of this to you. I'm hoping that you've read this before. But these are Genesis 1, 26 to 28. So this is where we're getting the story of God's creation. Let us make mankind in our image. That's important. In our likeness, also important. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move. 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. It's repeated. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. And it goes on. I have the word earth highlighted here because I think it's really important. It's an important point. There's a lot of important points here. First, that we're made in the image of God. We are image bearers. Second, that we are to be fruitful. What does that mean? What does it mean to be fruitful at the end of your life? How do you know if you're fruitful? Well, in a literal sense, you bear fruit. But what does that mean? I'm going to make the claim that you unleash your human creativity on the earth and that that's your job. And note here, I highlight the word earth. We know from this account of Genesis that God created man and woman, put them in the garden. But our job was never to stay in the garden. Now what happens in Genesis? We sin, the fall is extended to all of creation, it breaks our relationship with God, it breaks our relationship with ourselves, with the creation, with each other, right? So the fall damages God's intentions. But if you look at this verse, this verse comes before the fall. We were always to leave the garden, but not because we were kicked out. We were to leave the garden because we were to build cities. We were to build civilizations. We were to subdue the earth. That's our job. And each and every one of us plays a vital role in doing that. And I'm going to kind of expand on that. So we go to the second chapter of Genesis. We're, excuse me, I'm using the New International Version here. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So the job description that we're given is reiterated. What are we to do? We're to work it and take care of it. Work it is a Hebrew word, abad. It is literally translated to serve. Remember I talked about what's our main tagline here? We want to serve strangers. We want to live in that world where people have incentives to serve strangers. This is biblical. Genesis 2, serve the creation. Work it and serve it. And those are different phrases in the Hebrew. So what does it mean? Well, I want to give you an example. How many people have ever, you know, babysat or um, dog sat or, you know, house sat or something like this, right? So you're college students or high school students, but you've done that before, and you want to earn a, a little extra cash. And you go to somebody's house and you watch their house over the weekend. What do you do? You're going to water the plants and feed the cat and take the mail in. You're not putting an addition onto the house, right? That might be beyond the scope of your responsibilities. You might not do what the owner wanted you to do, but you're to take care of it. You're to preserve it. But the distinction here is that we're not just to take care of God's creation. We're not to leave it untouched. We're not to look at the garden and just say, don't trample on it. We're actually supposed to take care of it, but also cultivate it. And how do we do it? We do it by unleashing our human creativity on that. On that. So uh, theologian Jonathan Pennington uh, wrote a paper uh, on what it means to understand biblical flourishing. You can find it on our website. And this is a quote from him. 
He says that human flourishing is the universal quest of all humans. <coughs> all human activity can be seen as a desire to flourish. It is written into who we're created to be. So this is his, this is, these are his words. Human health, wholeness, resulting in strength, fertility, and longevity. That's what it means to flourish. The vision of shalom, shalom is the word we see most often in scripture referencing this bigger idea of flourishing, is at the core of God's redeeming work. It's not a subsidiary goal, it's not a secondary goal, that God's redeeming work in the world is to bring about flourishing. And I take you back to Genesis, go back and read it tonight. What is the language you see? There's abundance. There's trees and flowers and animals and the birds or the sky is filled with birds, right? And the rivers are teeming with fish. There is abundance. There is the ability to flourish. There is the absence of sin. Our sin doesn't change what God asked us to do. It just makes it a lot harder. So every day we have to overcome our sin to try to do our job. Our job doesn't change. What God wanted for his creation doesn't change because we sinned. We just made it harder on ourselves. So how do we get human health? How do we get longevity? Well, I'm going to make the claim that we have to embrace the economic way of thinking and we need the right sets of institutions, which requires economic freedom. And this is the best way we can care for the poor in the long run. So there's a couple other, other biblical references that I want to take you to. The Bible does not contradict itself, so the meta-narrative of Scripture is very clear on what we're to do and how we're to do it. But to take, dig a little deeper here, this is a passage from Jeremiah 29.7, which is probably familiar to you. We're asked to put our talents to productive uses, and we are asked to be profit seekers. Well, sometimes when I talk to Christians and you say the word profit, People recoil at that because it sounds like a bad thing. And your mind might be taken to, you know, tycoons on Wall Street who we think are all bad guys. There's probably some that are bad guys, for sure. But there's bad guys on Wall Street just like there's bad guys who are plumbers. Because that's a human heart condition, right? That's a condition of sin. It doesn't matter what your vocation is. So the question is, what changes people's incentives so that they are encouraged to seek profits in productive ways? Well, Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles, and he says, Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you, for if it prospers, you prosper. That's not a zero-sum game. Seek the peace, the shalom, and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you, for if it prospers, you prosper. There's a core biblical idea here. We are meant for each other in community. And I'm going to pull this out a little bit further, but we cannot do, we cannot make contributions to human flourishing on our own. If we're left to our own devices, we are going to fail. That we can only bring about flourishing, that we can only seek the prosperity of the city with each other so that we can rely on each other. One more here. A scriptural example of how we are called to put our talents to productive use and be good stewards is the parable of the talents, which you probably also have heard before and might recall. But if you think about the uh, parable as it appears in Matthew, and you read the first few sentences of the parable, you hear the, the master's orders when he leaves. That he gives each servant different amounts of talents. Look at the scripture. It says each according to his ability. One person gets five. One person gets two. One person gets one. Each according to his ability. So this idea here that's present is that we all have different abilities. Your abilities in the modern world don't define your dignity. What def neither does your bank account balance, by the way which is what the culture would tell you, right? He who has the most fame or the most money wins. No, you have dignity because you're created in the image of God. That applies to you whether you're a janitor or a Wall Street tycoon. If God's created you to do it, it's your job to do it well and with integrity and to do it by seeking profits. So if you're given five talents, put them to productive use. Read through the rest of the parable. What does it say? When the master returns, the person who had five talents made five more. 
He says, enter into the joy of your master. You have been responsible over a little. I will put you responsible over a lot. Same thing to the two talent person. I've given you much. You've made 100%. I've put you a responsibility. I've given you responsibility over a little. I'm going to put you in over a lot. Enter into the joy of your master. What happens to the one talent person? They go outside and they dig a hole in the ground and they hoard it. They don't want anything to happen to the talent. They're just protecting it. They're not cultivating it. And they're punished. Leave the joy of your master. And, and they are sent outside where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We all want to hear at the end of our lives, well done, good and faithful servant. How do you do that? Well, what I want to leave you with today is that you have a job to do that only you can do, and when you do it well, you are best empowered to help other people, most particularly the poor. We were talking over lunch, and I said, made this claim that there's a very, uh, Martin Lu a quote from Martin Luther that I love that's, not, that's underquoted, and he said, the best way to love your neighbor is to do your job well. The best way to love your neighbor is to do your job well. We don't think about it that way, I don't think. But that doing what God has created you to do to the best of your abilities is the best way for you to help the planet. It's the best way for you to serve strangers. And it's a best, the best way that you, when we all do this, we can help the poor. All right. So what I've just described to you is what, what I call what, at, inside my organization, we call the four-chapter gospel. We didn't coin that term, that phrase. But really, it, it's revealing of what's happened in, I think, the church broadly defined over the past 150 years. We've kind of truncated the four-chapter gospel to a two-chapter gospel. And the cha two chapters, if you talk to most Christians that they understand, is that I'm fallen, I'm a sinner, and I need salvation. And so once I'm saved, I, the redemptive process starts in my life, right? And I, sanctification and all this type of stuff. That's important, but it's not the whole story. We need the four chapters to understand both where we come from and where we're going. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what's going to happen when Christ returns? And he restores his creation so that it experiences full flourishing in the way that he designed it to be. Do you think all the stuff you did here is going to just burn up? That's not right. If he has you here and he's called you to be an accounting major, that has eternal significance. If it's what he's created you to do, it's eternally significant. We don't fully understand what that looks like, but I tell you what, I think it's empowering. It makes me want to wake up in the morning and be the best economist, mother, wife, <laughs> all that stuff that I can. Because I, each day is a new chance to do that, to unleash your talents on the planet. And when God comes back to restore his creation, all this stuff, all the classes you're taking, all the hours you study, doesn't just become insignificant. That somehow by being an undergraduate student and doing it well, you're fulfilling your job description as God has given it to you. That gives college a whole new meaning. It's significant. So I want to kind of start to lay down some economic principles. I'm going to start with just the micro kind of ideas of who we are. And then I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to make a claim that when we have the right sets of institutions, which I'm going to define broadly as economic freedom, then we can make a lot of advances to this bigger idea of human flourishing. And human flourishing, as experienced under economic freedom, is what has lifted all those people out of poverty just in the last 20 years, but even more importantly, over the last 200 years. So what is our anthropology? Who are we? How did God design us? Well, we're unique. There's never been another you on the planet, and there never will be. There's never been anyone who's exactly like you. Now, you're going to have a job that a lot of other people have. You're going to be an attorney, or you're going to be a teacher. And there's a lot of teachers in the world, but only you can teach like you were created to teach. So you're going to bring your own bundle of gifts and talents and preferences and abilities to that job. So you do it in, in your way. You're unique. That's important, actually, and has big economic implications, which I'll come back to. We value things subjectively. You have your own preferences and your own tastes. It's why some of you, well, I'm in Texas, so everybody probably likes country music. But I was going to say, some people like country music. Some people like classical music, right? Some people like olives on their pizza. Some people like pepperoni. Some people don't like pizza at all. 
right? So we have these preferences that are hardwired into who we are. And those hardwired preferences are actualized in our economic choices. If you don't like olives, they don't end up in your grocery cart, right? If you really like peanut butter, then maybe it's in your grocery cart every week. It's your preferences reconciled against your income. So we value things subjectively. That's how we are created. We are intentional. This is the great insight, by the way, of Adam Smith, who was not a Christian as far as I know, and some of the Austrian economists, uh, one of whom won the Nobel Prize, F.A. Hayek, also not a Christian. What made them good economists was that they had these, they understood these truths about humans, that people are intentional. We don't wind up robots, you know, those little toys, you wind it up in the back and it goes across the table. That's not who we are. We're not pre-programmed. We have purpose. We are always in a state of trying to advance our conditions. So, <clears throat> you know, we seek benefits and we try to minimize costs. We're intentional. We're value creators. We want to create, here's the thing, we want to create value for ourselves. I want the best grade I can get on my history test. I want the best job I can find with the biggest income and the best benefits package. But how do we live in a world where everybody else is a value creator, where they all want to create value for themselves? That's the big historical question, because it's only just recently in human history changed that we can create value for ourselves and also be stimulated to create value for other people. This is new phenomenon in human history that we are the beneficiaries of. And we're profit seekers. The word I want you to use from an economic perspective for profit is leftover. We don't like to be called profit seekers, I don't think. Somehow we think it makes us greedy capitalists. Now forget all that rhetoric. But you like leftovers, right? You like leftovers. So in other words, why study for 10 hours when you can study for eight and still get an A? <laughs> Maybe that's overstating it, I don't know. I don't know how much you study, right? Why go to college for six years when you can pay for the same degree in four? Right? We're profit seekers. We want leftover. We want leftover time at the end of the day. We want leftover money in our bank account. And this is the first step out of poverty, leftovers. People who are poor don't have a lot of leftovers, both in physical capital, financial capital, or human capital. And it, what's, it's what keeps them poor. You guys have a lot of leftovers, such that you don't even you know, have to. Um, you can go to college and maybe have a part-time job or a full-time job. But you're, and you're freed to do that. Your counterpart in a place like Venezuela currently, or Botswana, doesn't have time to go to college because you're trying to figure out where you're going to get your next meal. Not a lot of leftovers. And when we don't have a lot of leftovers, we can't do as well what God has asked us to do. So poverty harms God's greater purposes in the world. It's not the fault of those who are poor, and that's why we have to be smart about how we're going to change this. Now, how does this all manifest itself, our anthropology, these characteristics that I've talked about? Well, we make decisions. That, really, economics, I always joke that economists, if you're going to like a cocktail party or something, and I tell people I'm an economist, they just run away. Nobody wants to talk to an economist, so we just really talk to each other, right? Um, because they think we're boring, and I understand why. But really, economics is about what you do every day. You make decisions under conditions of uncertainty and radical scarcity. And what are you trying to do in all of that? You don't know everything you need to know, and you have to make trade-offs, so you want to make the best decision possible at the lowest cost. That's what you do every day all the time. So economics is absolutely applicable to your quest to figure out what God has asked you to do and to be a good steward in doing it. So forget about GDP and trade deficits and all the stuff you learn in class. I mean, don't fully forget about it, but economics starts with, where am I going to go to college? What job am I best suited for? What should I buy at the grocery store when I only have $50 to spend? That's economics, and it requires good economic thinking. And it's, it's uh, manifested through self-interest. Christians don't like this word either, because we confuse self-interest and greed. So let me un you know, kind of separate those two ideas. Self-interest is just the mechanism of human choice. Remember, I said we have subjective values, right? I particularly, I'm one of those people that I don't love olives, so they don't really show up in my grocery cart very often. That's my preference. 
right? It's my self, in my own self-interest to not buy olives. It's not a moral or an immoral condition. I just don't like them, right? If you like them, they're probably in your grocery cart. It's self-interest that mani is manifested in the things we choose. And look, it appears in scripture, our appeal to our own self-interest, which is really Adam Smith's big insight in economic history, okay? So Philippians tells us, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but to the interest of others. So this is the distinction between greed and self-interest. Greed is unmitigated desire. I'm going to exploit you. I'm going to step on you. I'm going to lie. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to swindle. I'm going to steal to get what I want. Anybody ever had a greedy impulse? You don't have to raise your hand. Yes, we're sinners, right? <laughs> Self-interest is the way you make choices. Greed is a condition of the human heart. And in a world where we're not going to convert everybody to Christianity, how is it that we live amongst all these self-interested and sometimes greedy people and also find ways to peacefully cooperate? That's the $64 million question, and it's the key to unlocking poverty alleviation. Adam Smith had the big insight, which is what makes him so famous. And if you've never read him, I'm sure you've heard his name, right? And he said, individual ambition can serve the common good. That my desire to make money so that I can feed my family can actually serve strangers. But it depends on the institutions. And so we have to get those right. So what is economics? I want to do another translation. I said profits are leftovers. Economics is stewardship. Actually, if you go to the Greek and you look at the root word for economics, it's oikonomia, which I'm probably not saying very properly. It means to manage a household. This is the economic way of thinking that you're engaging in in your own personal lives every single day. You're managing the resources close to you. Most importantly, your time. Time is your most precious asset because we all only have 24 hours in a day. In fact, time, I always say, is the great equalizer. Bill Gates and I, we've got the same amount of time in our day. And you don't know how many days you have. And so if you're going to be a good steward with what God has gifted you, every decision counts. Everything you do matters. And you want to maximize the benefit and minimize the cost. That's good stewardship. So we want to maximize value creation for the glory of God by making good decisions. That's what economics is, and it's biblical. It's biblical. It's the only way to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So the next thing I'm going to do is kind of talk about some of these economic realities that we must embrace if we're going to do this well, if we're going to be good stewards and um, show good stewardship in the right way. Incidentally, I think in the Christian church, stewardship is used in a very narrow way. We tend to use it and we think about giving money, right, tithing. There's a the committee at my church, and it's called the Stewardship Committee. And they're not worried about, you know, anything other than my money. And we also tend to think of stewardship in the church as, am I volunteering my time in the church? Those are important things, and yes, they are part of stewardship. But I like to call this whole life stewardship. And by that, what I mean is that every decision you make is consequential and matters. And it's a chance to glorify God through your time. Because the thing about time is that once it's gone, you can't ever get it back. And so you don't want to be wasteful in that regard. So stewardship is about all of our decisions. So this first economic reality becomes very important. And I will say about these economic realities, they're very much the same as kind of the laws of physics. You know, I don't have to have a PhD in physics to know that I got to be aware of gravity. And if I'm not aware of gravity, I'm going to get hurt. So for example, if I walk to the top of this building and walk off the side, what's going to happen? Bad things. I'm going to fall. So I'm either going to not walk off the side of tall buildings or I'm going to protect myself in some way, right? That's a reality of the world and it imposes a constraint upon me. Economic realities impose constraints upon us. It is when we don't acknowledge them that we often go astray. And we might actually do what I said before, harm the very people we're intending to help. So the first one is that we live in a world of scarce resources that have multiple and competing ends. What does that mean? Multiple and competing ends. I have a picture of lumber here. I mentioned in my uh, lunch talk, there's a great article I encourage you all to read if you haven't read it in your econ class. It's called I Pencil. 
and you can find it online. It's a three-page story of a pencil and how the pencil comes to be. It's written from the point of view of the pencil. It's cute. And it's about 60 years old and very relevant for good economic thinking. And the thing about the pencil is that you can imagine that there's loggers that are going to wake up in South Carolina tomorrow and they're going to go do their job and they're going to cut down trees and that wood is going to be put on a truck and that truck is going to go to a manufacturing plant. And once we decide that some of the wood goes to make tables, that wood is gone. It can't be a table and a piece of printer paper. It can be one or the other. That's scarcity. And scarcity is our toughest reality because it means all of our decisions bring costs. So, let's see if I, yeah, our decisions bring costs. Nothing is free. We love the word free. Everybody perks up, right, when you hear free. That's why advertisers, you go into a grocery store, buy one, get one free. Are you getting something for free? No, you're getting a discount, right? Nothing is free. If I said, hey, I'm going to round everybody up. I've never been to Lubbock before, so you'd have to tell me. But if I say, I'm going to round everybody up after class, and I'm going to take you to the nicest restaurant in Lubbock, and I'm going to pay. You're college students. You might say, awesome, I could use a free meal, right? But it's not free because you have to give up your time to go. It's cheaper than it would be for you to go by yourself, but there's still a cost. There's always a cost. So that's really important because if we dedicate resources towards poverty alleviation programs, we A, better make sure they work because the resources that we dedicate to that are gone. We can't use them simultaneously for something else. So we don't have a magic pot of money from which we can endlessly draw. And thinking that we do is actually very damaging to economies. It's, it's damaging to stewardship. So another economic reality, we can't create something out of nothing. Ex nihilo, we can't, only God can do that. So we are sub-creators. God is the master artist, the master creator. He can create and did and has created something out of nothing. We are not capable of doing that. So he, and I think this is just very stunning uh, and, and shows the depths of his love for us. He did not need us. He wanted us. People that he knew would defy him through sin but he created us anyway because he wanted a relationship with us. Amazing. Amazing. But we are not God, right? We cannot create something out of nothing. But we can and we should create something out of something. So economists use this like shorthand acronym. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch, which if you've taken econ, you probably got that on your first or second day. Nothing is free. Reinforcing this idea that there's always cost to our actions. So if we want to be good stewards, we have to really incorporate these ideas. And then we have limited gifts and abilities. We can't solve poverty on our own. We can't um, end hunger. We can't end war. We can't end terrorism. Whatever the bad thing is, not, no one person can do that. That's the story, actually, of this little eye pencil story. It shows you that we need each other. And guess what? That's how God created us. This is his design. He did not create us to be unilateral forces in the universe. We need to come together and depend on each other. So how do we do that? And then finally, I'll say on the economic realities, we have to we have respond to incentives. People have to have reasons to do things. They have to be encouraged and incentivized. So this is a picture of Walmart. And when I go to Walmart, you know, what I notice is that the lights are on. It's open really long hours. Has anybody ever, you should Google the um, mission statement of Walmart. They've changed it many times, but it's always very similar. I think right now it says, save more, live better. It used to be always low prices, always. What is their mission statement? To make sure your shampoo is the cheapest it can possibly be. Why is that? Is it because they're Christians? I don't know. They make more money that way, right? So they actually, it's kind of crazy. They actually have an incentive to find ways for me, somebody they don't know. I show up with my two kids on a Saturday, pushing around the cart. They don't know me. I don't know the Walton family. But they have a reason to serve anonymous strangers that they'll never meet. In what way do they choose to do it? Giving me cheap bananas and shampoo. This is particularly important if you're poor. What you need are cheap bananas and shampoo and all these other things. So this is really key. Walmart doesn't do this out of the goodness of their heart. They have incentives to do it. And they engage in highly productive behavior to make sure that your bananas are cheap. 
that gives you more time, more leftovers, more profit in your own lives. So when we incorporate these economic realities, we can go from these radical conditions of scarcity and mere survival into flourishing. And I'm trying to make a case that biblical flourishing is what you're here to be a part of. That your responsibility to the universe is to help it flourish. And that you do that by unleashing your human creativity on the planet. Well, when I think about that, I get kind of fired up about being a good economist. Because that's what God's called me to do. He's going to call all you to do different things. So we know the economic realities. We've talked about the biblical principles and our goal, our objective. So then how does kind of economics then start to play itself out? And, and what are the constraints that the poor have that you and I don't have? Well, I would say what it is is trade. That people who are poor are not poor because you know, they live in a place with no natural resources. That was an idea advanced by economists a lot. Or that they have lower IQs. Or that they are of a different religious background. Or that they are, um, you know, a different color, skin. All these ideas were publicly discussed over the 20th century to try to understand why some nations were rich and some nations were poor. And I will go back to Adam Smith and say, it's about trading partners. If you're poor, you limit, you have limited trading partners. So I want you to have a mental model. When you think of the poor, don't, when you say the poor, I don't think that's a helpful term. Who are you talking about? So for me, I have a mental model of my female counterpart in a place like Ghana or Zimbabwe. And I think about what it's like for her to get water every day. And this is what it's like. She has to walk potentially up to four miles carrying dirty jugs filling the water jugs, walking back with her children in tow. This affects mostly females and their, and their daughters, so they don't go to school. So they're lugging the water back. They're crudely purifying it so that they can drink it, water that you would not drink unless your life depended on it. And guess what hers does? And this activity, by my you know, crude estimates, probably costs her about 3,000 calories a day. She doesn't have 3,000 calories. We do. She doesn't. Here's the irony. This is how I get water. I go to Walmart or Target or my grocery store. And if I'm just going to get water, it takes about 15 minutes to leave my house, get in my car that's air conditioned and heated and has airbags in it, go get the water and come back home. It probably costs 100 calories. Maybe not even that. Why is that? Because she doesn't have trading partners. And I do. I have many, as do you. So this is the problem. And when you spend all day getting the water, you're not able to cultivate your gifts. So what I think, when I think about her, what I think about is this is an image bearer. This is somebody who was made in the image of God, who had, does not have the opportunity to go to school like you are, to cultivate their talents because they're stuck getting the water every day. That's the curse of poverty. As I said, there's never been a greater time to escape this. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip some of my stories here. So here's what I want to show you about how the world's changed recently. It's pretty astounding. This is a graph of <coughs> GDP, gross domestic product, uh, global GDP. So GDP over the whole globe from AD 1, which is a long time ago, to now. This is called the hockey stick graph. And you are very blessed because you and I live in the handle of the hockey stick. Most of humans over most of human history have left, by economist estimates, have lived at about $100 a year or less. You're collecting the water. You're fleeing or trying to protect yourself from an, uh, an oppressive government. You're dying early of famine and disease and malnutrition and something happens. And the world, you know, human creativity is able to be traded and unleashed in a way that's unprecedented and never has before. This is what we need more of and faster for the still one billion people who live in abject poverty. So there's really good news here, but I think also a lot of work that's yet to be done. And so I want to kind of wrap, round out this talk, kind of talking about economic freedom as the solution to poverty. And economic freedom is a set of institutions that we understand uh, that people have the ability to engage in economic exchange that's largely unfettered, meaning people can open a coffee shop, you can 
you know, open a restaurant. You can uh, go to the store and nobody forces you to buy bananas or bread from a certain company. You get to choose. As well, we measure economic freedom by the protection of property rights. Your property rights are protected and others are protected from oppression, of, uh, from exploitation. So when we have a society that's rich in economic freedom, remember I said people respond to incentives? Then now we start to have the right set of institutions that encourage productive behavior. It encourages the Walmarts to say, I'm going to run a whole business based on cheap shampoo, among other things, right? That's what we want. That's what your counterpart, whoever you think of when you think of the poor, that's what they need. Access, alternatives, choices. Economic freedom gives us those things. Now, economists <laughs> formally measure economic freedom. I'm going to stop here before I do that and ask you if you know who this guy is. I just put his name up there. But has anybody ever heard of Henry Turkle? No, he's never been on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. He's never been written up in Time Magazine. This is a picture of him. I had to scourge the internet to try to find this picture. There was one. He's a person that had incentives to help people because he lived in a society rich with economic freedom. And I'm going to come back in a few minutes as I end this talk and tell you how he helped save my daughter's life. And that I only got that opportunity because I live in a society, as do you, rich with economic freedom. So I already described what it's like to have economic freedom. These are the actual things economists measure. So they go across countries and they give people numerical scores on these five benchmarks. The size of the government, the freedom to trade, the soundness of money, so central banking and monetary policy matters here, uh, freedom to trade internationally, the security of one's property rights, and then the regulation of markets and businesses. Is it hard to get into a business? Are there lots of regulations? Do we have to bribe people? Is there a lot of corruption? So that's what we're measuring, OK? Those five things, we go out and collect empirical data, and then we give the country a score. Zero is no freedom. 10 is lots of freedom. No country has a zero. No country has a 10. So we live in the middle. And this is how economic freedom has changed across the globe in the last just 35, 40 years. In 1985, it was an average score of 5.36, right in the middle. Now it's about a 6.85. So it's getting better, but there's a lot of work to do still. Countries, by the way, that score, I don't know how well you can see this in the back, but this is just for your information. The countries that are at the top of the economic freedom score are places where property rights are well protected and defended, and there's lots of entrepreneurial activity. Hong Kong and Singapore have battled it out for number one for two decades. New Zealand, Switzerland, out of nowhere, the UAE is now number five. Mauritius, Jordan, so countries that we never thought would have any remote degree of economic freedom are charging out of the gates. These are the least free countries. Look at the very bottom. Venezuela, now dead last in the economic freedom of the World Report. If you read just any morning of any given day, in the last year you Google Venezuela, and you're going to see stories of people who are losing their country because of bad government policy and excessive intervention in the economy, and there are babies in hospitals in Venezuela that are going to die because they can't get routine medicines that you get just by walking into your pharmacy. That should be unacceptable to us as Christians, because it's not necessary. This is avoidable. It's avoidable. Con Democratic Republic of Congo, Libya, Chad, Syria, these are the places where people lack trading partners. And they lack personal property rights, thus they lack the incentive to serve strangers. So economic freedom is not just something that economists talk about. I'm making the moral, biblical claim that you should care about it if you care about the poor. You really should care about economic freedom. And what is your role in making this work better? So just some consequences of economic freedom. I won't necessarily go over all these. But the first and most positive correlation that we see is that when societies have a lot of economic freedom, they have a lot more per capita income. $38,601 is the average income of a person living in a society ranked as most free. Almost $7,000 is your average per capita income in a society that's least free. So that's a profound difference in your ability to either walk into a grocery store or have to grow your own food in your backyard. And remember, these limit our leftovers, limit our profit opportunities. 
economic freedom and extreme poverty, what we see is that you move into the most free countries, very, very low rates of abject poverty. And one of the reasons for that is because we have so much accumulated capital that we have a lot of leftovers to help the marginalized and the vulnerable. Think of the poorest of the poor in Afghanistan. There's no safety net. There's no churches even, local churches that have the resources from people who tithe to help people in their community. Why do we have that here? Because we have lots of leftovers. So this is what's lacking. Life expectancy. I talked about time being a precious and scarce resource. If you live in the least free societies, your average age is 63. If you live in the most free societies, your average age is 80. Angus Deaton won the Nobel Prize in Economics last October. He's written a book called The Great Escape. He's a fantastic um, thinker, economic thinker about health, global health and well-being. He says that a, a woman in the United States, born today, has a 50-50 chance of living to 100. That's incredible. When you think of people who are dying at very early ages unnecessarily, why? Because they can't get a flu vaccine. I can get a flu vaccine for free at my grocery store. I don't even have to go to a doctor's office. That's what's available to me in a free society. So these are profound things. Again, I want to reinforce not just the talk of economists around <laughs> water coolers. And then infant mortality. We're called to be fruitful and multiply. If you know that most of your gonna ch children are going to die before the age of five, which was the human condition for most of human history, life becomes very hard and tedious, and you're likely to die giving birth. And this is the case. The more, the least, uh, excuse me, the least free societies have much higher rates of infant mortality. The most free societies, very rare to die giving birth or as a child before the age of five. And then we look at some specific case studies. I won't go through all of these in great detail, but look at just Botswana as a great case study of a country who started surging in economic growth in the late 90s and early 2000s. 10% GDP growth a year, by the way, we would kill for that. We have about 1.7. Just coming out, charging out of the gates. And as economic freedom starts to go up and they have these improvements in material well-being, HIV starts to tank. That's going to truncate your longevity if you have a disease that wipes out a population. So these types of things are important, again, for this bigger concept which God wants for us, which is biblical flourishing. I'm going to skip this. So, <coughs> sorry, I'm just going to fast forward so I can take more questions. I want to end with two stories. And one is a, one of my favorite stories in economics. It's in the book, Basic Economics. I don't know if your professors have you read that. It's a great book. It's by Thomas Sowell. And in the second chapter, he tells the story of Boris Yeltsin. Does anybody know who that is, who that was? So after the fall of communism in the Soviet Union and the failure of Por perestroika under Mikhail Gorbachev, Boris Yeltsin becomes the president of Russia. And Boris Yeltsin comes to Texas in about 1991 and he visits a NASA plant which is what dignitaries do when they visit other countries right they go look at you know look at all the cool stuff we're doing with space exploration and Boris Yeltsin is touring the plant and he says to his host whoever that was I want to go to a grocery store this is unscheduled so it probably freaked a lot of people out you know the president wants to go to a grocery store we got to stop you know rearrange everything so they go to a local Houston grocery store you can google the story and Boris Yeltsin walks up and down the aisles, and that experience in an American grocery store in the 1990s changes his life and changes his ideas about the efficacy of central planning versus economic freedom. He would later write about it in his autobiography. And this is an actual picture, it's so grainy because I had to blow it up, but he's in the popsicle aisle, which is probably part of his enthusiasm. I get excited in the popsicle aisle also. <laughs> Um, and you can imagine, this is, okay, so what I want you to think about, this is one of the most politically powerful people on the planet, okay? One of the most, the richest people on the planet. The person who has minions and cronies and advisors at his beck and call. And you know what he couldn't do? Make grocery stores happen. So he's wandering up and down the aisles and he says, I don't understand. He actually pulls over the manager of the grocery store and says, do you have to have a special education to run a grocery store? 
because under central planning where the government was dictating every aspect of society, we didn't have grocery stores and people died. That's the story. And he didn't understand it. He said he felt both overwhelmed at the cornucopia of stuff in front of him and depressed. He's quoted in the grocery store as saying, if the Russian people hear of it, they will surely revolt. I bet. Because the problem is the Russian people thought poverty was their status quo and had to be. They didn't know that there was a possibility to flourish where you can meander down grocery store aisles and not be fist fighting over a loaf of bread. This was the Russian experience and people starved. That's not your experience, right? I actually get annoyed going to the grocery store if there's a lot of people there. I'm so wealthy, I get to be annoyed by things that I should be in awe of. So if there's anything you take away from this, it's to stop and be in awe of the things around you. So the last kind of thing I'll end with is that economic freedom saves lives, and that's why we need to be in favor of it. It pushes back poverty. It's the force that's created that hockey stick graph, and we need more of it. And as Christians, there's an extra kind of added layer of responsibility there. We don't have a choice. We have to advocate for this. We have to play a productive role. So your job is to figure out what God has created you to do and do it with integrity to the best of your ability, and you're then part of this process. And so I have two ways of thinking about this. Economic freedom saves our lives in benign ways that we take for granted every day, like going to the grocery store, right? It's a chore, I don't feel like it. Yet you should be cheerleading up and down the aisles when you're in there. This is amazing. I don't have to grow my own corn. Awesome, because I don't know how to do that, right? I wouldn't have corn if I had to do it myself. And I think of dentistry. I don't, this, this is, you know, again, a picture from the internet. I don't know this sweet boy, but his expression uh, is revealing of how I feel when I go to the dentist. I don't like it. It's not my favorite thing to do. But actually, if you look at the innovations in dental history, they are one of the things that have caused our longevity to increase so much. Because in 1500, if you had a rotten tooth and that went to your brain, you were dead at 20. Dead at 20, 25. That's going to hurt your well-being and your flourishing if you're dead. <laughs> right? So it sounds silly, but it's very true. So just going to the dentist twice a year for a checkup, flossing, brushing your teeth, using some Listerine, dramatically extends your longevity in ways that you take for granted. I have to force my six-year-old to brush his teeth. He thinks it's like some form of torture, right? He won't appreciate till later that this is life-saving. I'm helping him live to 100, hopefully. He has more chances to be a better steward over many years because he brushes his teeth. We take this stuff for granted. Maybe even we dread it. But we should be in awe of it. And then there's examples and stories of economic freedom that saves your lives or the lives of your family members in very, very profound ways. And here's mine. So remember I asked you who Henry Turkle was? He had a very important role in my daughter's coming into the world, which was very dramatic. <laughs> my daughter was born, well, my water broke when I was pregnant at 26 weeks. I was rushed to the hospital by my husband. And when we got to the hospital, my doctor said, you can't have the baby here. Because if you do, we're not equipped to handle micro preemies, which is what your daughter will be. And so we got to put you in an ambulance and take you to a teaching hospital down the road, which they did. And I went to Fairfax Hospital and I was on hospital bed rest for five weeks, five weeks. And every four hours of those five weeks, doctors and nurses and medical students would come in and they would check on me. And they were doing a couple things. They were checking my temperature, they were checking my blood pressure, and they were putting monitors on my belly to check the baby's heartbeat. And if there was anything wrong with my blood pressure or my temperature, it was going to be immediate C-section because those spikes in those things would, would be indicative of an infection. So every day those things didn't happen was a victory for her life. And I had a lot of time to think in this hospital bed. And I remember looking out the window, thinking about what was going on in the world while I was sitting there, and thinking again about my female counterpart in a place like Congo or Bangladesh. And what is her story? What is her ending when this happens to her? Because you know it does. Preterm labor happens all the time. But she doesn't get rushed in an ambulance equipped with a NICU to a teaching hospital and checked on by 
dozens of people every four hours, does she? No. She likely loses her child, and she might lose her life as well. What's the difference between me and her? I'm not better, I'm not smarter, I'm not more deserving. I don't know how to do anything that they did to take care of me. It is the fact that I live in a society rich with economic freedom that allowed me to depend on other people's talents that saved my life and hers. So then Bailey Grace was born at 31 weeks, still a preemie, three pounds, five ounces. And this was her life. This is how she lived for five weeks in a NICU. Preemies can't do three things that are extremely important. They can't feed themselves. They're not strong enough to suck. They can't regulate their body temperature and they can't regulate their heart rate. Any one of those threes you miss on and you're gonna die. And so she is sitting in this incubator basically having things do it for her. So I draw your attention to these cords that are going in by her feet that are checking her heart rate every time her heart rate crashes, alarms sound and people come running. And it's terrifying. I also call your attention to the little white line, can you see it, that's on her cheek? There's a little tube taped to her cheek in a loop and it's going in her nose and down into her belly and it's giving actually donated breast milk and feeding her because I couldn't. And that's how she lived and she survived. Who is Henry Turkle? Henry Turkle is the man who in 1953 filed a patent for the infant nasal feeding tube. Henry Turkle, who is dead, and been dead for a while, I will never get to say thank you to. But it's not just Henry, and by the way, Henry Turkle was do, a medical doctor doing um, work with Down syndrome babies who have muscular challenges and needed help feeding. And that was his impetus. He was a profit seeker. He had incentives to solve problems. And in 1953, he anticipated the problem I would have giving birth in 2013. And he solved it. But Henry Turkle isn't the only player here that's important. He's the one that I think of a lot. But there are hundreds of thousands of people that were involved in the process of just getting the infant nasal feeding to the tube to the hospital where I delivered Bailey. So there was a Federal Express truck driver who delivered boxes of tubes and he didn't know, or she, the role, the life-saving role they would play in just driving the truck and doing their job, doing it well. And then there was a janitor who took all of the boxes that the tubes came in and put them in the recycling bin. And the janitor played a role in saving my child's life. So you see, we give all the glory to the people like the lawyers and the doctors and the, Bill jo the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gateses of the world, and they deserve some credit. But none of those people could do our job if we're not out there doing our job. We need each other. We were made for community. And when we have economic freedom, the story is, and these are my kids now, I always have to show an after picture. So this is my little picture of flourishing, right? It's my little picture of flourishing. You're gonna have your little picture of flourishing brought to you by countless strangers who have incentives to serve you. Whether, and many of them are not gonna be believers. So this is the way we help the poor. So I think when we use our gifts and do what God has uniquely created you to do, you have more power than you think to make the world a better place. Now, I'll leave with one last thing. That doesn't mean you're not called to help the poor right here and now. You may be called to help victims of floods, victims of disease, but I would encourage you that, I think as Christians we like to drop in with our help and then we leave. What we really need to, help, to do if we want to help the marginalized is not just give them the temporary assistance they need, but to give them the long-term abilities to live into their gifts and talents. Because the world is missing out. There are people, a billion people who live in poverty right now. Think of the Einsteins and the entrepreneurs and the cancer-fighting drugs that we're missing out on because people can't even think about those things because they just have to survive. So I'm going to stop there um, and I'll take any questions if we have them or if we have time. <laughs>